we are ready now to talk about the definite integral and this is the the tool that we um, make use of most uh, in calculus 2. I would say in calculus 1 the tool you made use of was the derivative finding finding a derivative and we'll tie this definite integral into the derivative um, as we we go through the next several lectures it'll take a little bit um, we will eventually get to what we call the fundamental theorem of calculus that basically ties uh, calculus 1 and calculus 2 together. Um, but when, there's a lot of, you can see a lot of definition here, a lot of stuff to talk about. Some of you are familiar with this. You, you might have seen definite integrals already. Um, but I'll just say this too, that it is not um, really much different than what we actually finished with uh, with the last set of lectures. On um, you know area finding the area under a curve and we'll tie that together with this and essentially the first two examples will be just like the last example I did in in the last lecture so let's let's get into it here's the definition of what we mean by the definite integral what is this thing well first of all we start with a function f that's continuous okay so that sounds familiar and it's defined on a closed interval from a to b that sounds familiar we're going to partition the interval a, B into N subintervals, and we're going to do it with equal width, okay? So delta X, remember, in that case, is the length of the interval, which would be minus B minus A divided by N, right? So this is what we had last time. You know, the partition is where we just divide it, subdivide it up into N, N uh, subintervals. And remember, our, our, our notation was X sub 0 was, was the left endpoint A, and then we had X sub 1, X sub 2, all the way to x sub n, which was which was b. These were the endpoints. So the first uh, subinterval would be from x sub zero to x sub one. So x sub, for the first subinterval, x sub zero is the left endpoint, x sub one is the right endpoint. Second subinterval is from x sub one to x sub two. All right, x sub one in that case is the left endpoint, and x sub two is the right endpoint, and so on. Okay. Now, here's where where it gets a little different. We're going to choose points, and these points I'm going to use the letter c for. For each subinterval, I'm going to choose a, a point, an, an, an input value, an x value essentially, um, c1 through cn, such that ci lies in the what we could say the ith subinterval, which would be sub x sub i minus 1 to x sub i. So in the first subinterval, right, which is x sub 0 to x sub 1, we would have some, some c, c1. And it has to be between, uh, uh, in, in that interval. In other words, it could be the left hand endpoint, it could be the right hand endpoint, it could be the midpoint, or it actually could be any point in the interval. So we look specifically at left, right, and midpoint uh, summations essentially. And this says we can choose the CIs to be any of those as well as uh, other things. Um, okay, so with that then the definite integral, here's the definition, of the definite integral of the function f from a to b is, okay, what is this? This is the notation we use for it. Okay, so we'll talk about this notation. This is the definite integral of the function f from a to b. Okay, and it's equal to what? This is the, the definition or the limit definition. There's a limit, right, as n goes to infinity, and there's the summation, right, f of ci times delta x. This is nothing more than those summations that we saw. You know, if the c sub i's were the right-hand endpoints, this would be the right-hand approximation, right-hand sum approximation, because delta x is the width of every rectangle. Right, and f of ci in that case would be the height. So the height times the width, and you do that from i equal one to n. Right, for each subinterval, there's n of them. You add them all up. Right, and that's your that's your um, summation. It could be the right hand endpoints, left hand endpoints, midpoints, or in, in general any any point. But again, you let n goes to infinity, so let the number of subintervals increase without bound. If that limit exists, then that's equal to this definite integral, and so that ties it into what we've been talking about now. This, this little curly symbol here basically is an elongated S, and it's called the integral sign, and, and it stands for summation, really. That's why we use a, you know, it's, it looks like a fancy S, that's why it was used. And it's summation, because if you, ultimately we're talking about a summation process. Yeah, we're pushing the, the limit as n goes to infinity, but you have to first get the sum, add up all the parts, and then let the, the subintervals go to infinity. Okay. The function f of x that we're talking about is sometimes called the integrand. That word is the function we're integrating, we say, is the integrand. Uh, a and b are the limits of integration. A is the lower limit and b is the upper limit. Okay. Now, 
in most of the cases we were going to start off with a is indeed less than b which you know kind of makes sense lower limit is smaller than upper limit but in general that does not have to be the case a does not have to be less than b okay so it's a little misnomer you know lower limit upper limit lower limit just means you know looking at the integral sign it's the lower one down here and then the upper one but there's nothing to say that a has to be less than b in general but um, most of the examples we start with that is the case the process of evaluating the integral which means what actually pumping out this summation and then pushing the limit to, to uh, as n goes to infinity and finding the value of that limit that process is called integration now this little dx symbol here um, tells us the variable of integration or the dummy variable is x okay this is the same essentially notation that you saw with the derivative if you remember the derivative one notation the so-called Leibniz notation was the derivative of y with respect to x was what dy over dx there it is dx what is this it's really saying take the derivative this is really saying take the derivative with respect to x of the function y this is the differential operator it says take the derivative with respect to x of y so this dx tells us the variable we're integrating or, or differentiating with respect to here and in the same way this dx uh, treats uh, the, that we're finding the um, uh, integration with respect to the variable x and that's you know important uh, so this dx doesn't have a value okay, it's not a quantity um, but it, it is always written there that's important the actual function is just written here so this is not multiplication this is not f of x times dx really because dx its, it's quantity can be thought of as being equal to one essentially we're not you know we're, we're, we're just saying that's the, the same uh, idea here that we used the derivative notation for uh, the definite integral if it exists is a real number okay and and, and uh, if it does exist we say that the function f is integrable over that interval so that's the word we use if a function f of x this limit exists it's integrable not all functions could be integrable because uh, integrable because this limit remember may not exist limits as n goes with and some, sometimes limits do not exist okay so not every function is integrable um, but we'll find out most of our functions are again if they're continuous we're going to see that that's the case um, in fact let's just jump down here if the function is continuous then that limit always exists okay so all continuous functions are integrable the limit also exists for some discontinuous functions though so some discontinuous functions are integrable now here's an important tie-in from what we did before if the function if its outputs always greater than or equal to zero that means it, the graph of it is always above the x-axis over the interval from a to b or it could be on the x-axis I guess equal to zero but greater than or equal to zero then the definite integral represents what the area because that's what we did at the end right we took the the, re, the the sum here and then pushed the limit as n goes to infinity and that was the area under the graph of the function f and above the x-axis over that interval okay now a couple of closing things too this definition we we said equal with for our subintervals equal with okay and that's really the way we're going to go and, and do things but in general that doesn't have to be true and and the above definition could be adjusted if the intervals subintervals have different widths in this case sometimes you'll see that there will be defined a norm of the partition sometimes denoted this way sort of double like double absolute value of r's over p so partition is, is a way of subdividing the interval um, and um, this is defined the norm of that uh, partition is the maximum width of all the subintervals okay and so in this case as n goes to infinity we must have that norm going to zero the the the, the widest interval uh, subinterval that width has to go to zero and so you can replace uh, the limit as n goes to infinity with the limit as the norm of p goes to zero okay that's that's the more general definition uh, but we're going to stick to this one to keep things a little bit simpler uh, and by the way um, the sum on this hand before we take the limit this summation is called a Riemann sum this is Riemann it's the name of a mathematician who did essential uh, work in this area uh, a long time ago and so he gets his name on it so if you're here Riemann sum that's just the sum that we've been talking about and the, the Riemann sum could be again like we said depending on how you choose these CIs, it could be a right hand, it could be a left hand, it could be a midpoint, 
Well, it could be something totally different because it's random. You, you can choose the, the, the endpoints randomly. When we actually do the work, though, we'll see that we'll typically choose right-hand endpoints to make it easy. And if we choose right-hand endpoints for our CI, then here's the formula for generating them. And we used this in the last example in, in the last lecture. The CI is the A plus I delta X, right? So C1 is A plus delta X, right? That's, so A is the left-hand endpoint in the first interval. Add delta X will be to the second one, right? Um, uh, the the, the right-hand uh, endpoint of the first interval, sorry. So again, if you have X of 0, which is equal to A, and you add delta X, you get to X of 1, right? That's, that's, that's going to be the C sub 1. That's the C sub 1, A plus delta X. Uh, C sub 2 would be the, the next subinterval's right-hand endpoint, which is X sub 2, which would be what? C sub 2, A plus 2 delta X. And again, this is delta X, and this is delta X. Right? So A plus 2 delta X is X sub 2, and so on. So this is going to generate the right-hand endpoints. And in that case, plugging that in for the CI, right? F of CI gives me this as the Riemann sum. Okay, so we're going to do some examples. Remember in those examples, we made use of these power sums. Again, these will be given to you on tests or quizzes or anything. You don't have to memorize them. A lot of you will memorize this first one because it's, it's fairly easy, but um, you don't have to. These will be given to you. And these are the only three that we'll need. Okay, so let's evaluate a definite integral. Here's an example. We're going to use right-hand endpoints to find the value of the following definite integrals in the first one. Is the integral we say, here's how we say it, the integral from 1 to 5, lower limit is 1, upper limit is 5, of the integrand 2x minus 4. Again, the dx means nothing other than x is the variable of integration. Okay, so let's start out. So the first thing we need to know um, is uh, that the value of a, the lower limit, is 1. The value of b, the upper limit, is 5. Since we're using equally spaced subintervals, what's that going to be? It's, again, b minus a over n, so that's going to be 5 minus 1 over n, or 4 over n. There's our delta x. We're going to use right-hand endpoints, okay? And in that case, the ci's are a plus i delta x. So what is that? a is 1 plus i times delta x. So this is just 1 plus 4i over n. So I've got my delta x, I've got my ci's, I can now plug in. This thing here, by the definition that we just looked at, I'll show that to you again. Right, by the definition is what? Equal to the limit as n goes to infinity the sum i equal 1 to n f of ci and ci here is 1 plus 4i over n times delta x which is 4 over n okay and so this is the limit as n goes to infinity what is f of 1 plus 4i over n well the function this is the function f of x here. That's the integrand we call. That's the function we're integrating, we say, 2x minus 4. So this will be uh, in here 2x, and what's x? What's the input? 1 plus 4i over n minus 4. That's, that's the f of 1 plus 4i over n. That's the output. And then again, don't forget this 4 over n here. Okay. So what I want to do now is do a little simplification. So I want to simplify this out before I proceed any further. And uh, notice I'm first going to distribute this 2 through. And then I'm going to combine like terms. So 2, uh, 2 times 1 is 2, minus 4. 2 minus 4 will be negative 2. And 2 times 4i over n, 2 times 4i over n is 8i over n, and again we said 2 minus 4 is negative 2 or plus negative 2 or just subtract 2, right? So I've simplified that down to this, and now I'm going to distribute uh, the 4 over n over this, after I've simplified what's inside the brackets there 
I'll distribute that forward. Okay, so what do we get? Four over n times eight i over n. Four times eight is thirty-two i. N times n, n squared. Uh, two times four over n is eight over n. And then what I'm going to do is make use of our uh, linearity properties. Remember, so I have a sum of this minus that, so I can write that as the sum of this minus the sum of that. And then also, when I take the sum of just this part, 32i over n squared, i is the variable, right? i is the index here, that's what's changing, but the 32 over n squ squared is a constant multiple. And so I can pull that constant multiple out of the first sum, not both, but the first sum, leaving i. Over here, I'll just have the summation i equal 1 to n, 8 over n. Okay. Be real careful that 32 over n squared is just times this sum, not, not times this one. And don't forget, we've got the limit still going on. We, we do this last. The limit hangs around as n goes to infinity until we get this expression only in terms of n. Okay, So we're almost there. Take the limit as n goes to infinity. Now we've got this power sum, summation i equal 1 to n of, of i. And so we just looked at those power sum formulas, and here it is. Here's the sum, the first n integers, and we're gonna I'm gonna use this one again on the far right, n squared over two, uh, n squared divided by two plus n over two. And then and then what's this? Well, the eight over n is just a constant. Notice there's no i at all in here. So remember the summation i equal one to n of any constant means I'm adding this constant n times. So it's just n times that constant. And you can see what's going to happen very nicely there. In fact, let's go ahead and, um, and do that. That's how we got that in the parentheses by using the power sum formula for that. And so I get the limit as n goes to infinity and distribute this 32 over n squared over this, these two things. Notice here when I multiply 32 over n squared times n squared over 2, the n squareds cancel. I have 32 divided by 2, which is 16. Plus, here 32 divided by 2 again is 16, and n squared in the bottom, n in the top, leaves 1n in the bottom. 16 over n. And then here, what happens here? n times 8 over n, that's just 8. Okay. And, and I'll go ahead and take the limit now. I mean, I could simplify this further, but limit as n goes to infinity, what's going to happen? The 16 and the 8 don't change, but this 16 over n squared, what happens to that? As n goes to infinity, that goes to 0, right? And I'm left with, what, 16 minus 8, which is just 8. And that is the value of this integral, we say, of this definite integral. And remember, it's a real number. Okay? It could be positive, negative, 0, it could be any real number. So there is a lot of algebra. I do want you to, to be able to do this. Some of you know how to find this already. You already know the fundamental theorem of calculus, maybe. Um, and we will get there. Do you have to do this? Yes, you have to do this at least once. And I'm going to do one more example of this so, so do you see that. And I'm looking for you to neatly write out each step right, using correct notations. By the way, we use these... Um, I don't know if you've ever seen these two little lines, one over the other, but those are called equal signs. And you put those between things that are equal. And I would like you to do that, right? Equal signs, right? You can go left to right, you know, or down like I'm doing this way, um, but um, very carefully and neatly write that each step out. So you need to show the steps in the, in the process. You shouldn't go right from, you know, from here you know, down to here. Okay, you've got to show the progression. This is what I'm looking for that you understand. And it's just algebra. 90% of what we do in calculus is indeed algebra or trigonometry. Or geometry. In fact, talking about geometry, we can actually determine the value of this integral geometrically. Now let me illustrate this. Um, the function 2x minus 4, 
if I graph it, this is what it looks like, right? It's a line of slope 2, right? Rise, go up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1. And it's negative 4, you know, the y-intercept would be down here at negative 4. But here's the line. And we're interested, though, just from 1 to 5. So if I go from 1 to 5, let's see what's happening. Well, one thing for sure, from 2 to 5, what do we realize? What do, what's that this portion going to represent? Since from 2 to 5, we're talking about the area or the function being above the x-axis, right? Then this portion, we said what? will represent, uh, the, the integral would represent the area under this curve. And the neat thing about this area is, hey, we know how to find this area because this is a triangle. What's the area of a triangle? One half the base times height, right? So this will contribute a positive quantity and it's one half, what's the base? One, two, three units. And the height is one, two, three, four, five, six units. So it's 18, one half of 18 is nine. Nine square units there. Now what happens down here though? You know, from one to two, uh, we have uh, the function below. Now what's gonna happen with the function below? Well notice in the summation process, we evaluate the function at the right-hand endpoints, right? We'll have different sub-intervals here, you know, x1, x0, x1, x2, x3, and so on. Um, but each one of these, the, the right-hand endpoint will eva evaluate what? As a negative quantity, right? It's, you know, th this value is going to be a negative output. So when we say we multiply the width, which is positive, times the height, but in this case the height essentially is going to be a negative number. And so what's going to happen is the integral is going to give us this area of this, this small triangle here, except instead of a positive area, it will be a negative area. Because why? Because the, the value of the function is negative here. So what is the area of this region? It's, it's going to contribute as a negative quantity. Well, this area is one. It's going to be negative because of the, the, what we said. The value of the function is negative there from 1 to 2. Uh, the base is 1 unit, and the height is 2 units negative 1. And here's the key. If I take these two quantities and, and add them up, what do we get? Positive 9 plus a negative 1, what do we get? 8. And that is exactly the value of our definite integral. In fact, we can interpret definite integrals in terms of areas. The problem is, if it's not a linear function, then we don't have necessarily a shape we can find the area of. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to stop the video here, and um, we'll do the next video. We'll do one more example using the definite integral.